get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, materials colloquium. Um, my name is Professor Mauro Pasta. I work on energy storage, applied chemistry here in the department. It's my great, great pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Scott Warren from UNC, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for those of you that are not familiar with, with the US, just to clarify. Um, Professor Warren is now an associate professor at UNC in the chemistry department. He got his PhD from Cornell uh, in the US again. He spent some time in Europe as a postdoc at the PFL with Professor Grazzo. If you work on solar cell, you definitely know Professor Grazzo. Mm -hmm. Then did a postdoc for a couple extra years at Northwestern yes. before joining the faculty at UNC. Mm -hmm. I met Scott, when was it? A couple of years ago, yeah, virtually maybe. This is years. the first yeah, time two in, years. in yeah. two years, right? Yeah. First time in person, you know, we started to be interested a little bit more into transport of fluoride ion in electrolytes. And Scott is one of the leading authorities of fluoride ion in the world right now. He will talk about fluoride ion a bit, I guess, yes. in the presentation today. We actually ended up organizing what we think is the first <coughs> international yes. conference of fluoride ion batteries. We're not 100% sure, but we think it was the first one. <laughs> you can find anything else anywhere else. Um, today he will talk to us, I guess he'll give us an overview of his work on layered solids. It will also encompass some of the work on Florida. And with that, let me, let me join me in welcoming <laughs> Mara. That's a very kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be here, uh, you know, in the Hume Rothery building. We love, well, our lab loves solid state chemistry, and so it is exciting to be able to be here and share our enthusiasm for, for solid materials. Um, so this talk uh, will cover uh, several topics. Uh, one is going to be the, uh, the self-assembled structures of molecules and 2D materials. That was kind of an accidental discovery. Um, we'll also talk about these electrides that have electrons that sit in the inner layer space. And then at the very end, I'll talk about our work on sort of thin film or 2D amorphous materials in their characterization. So it'll, it'll cover a range of topics, and I'll kind of do an introduction in a second. But before I get, I get too far, I want to uh, acknowledge the fantastic students in, in our lab that have been doing this research. Um, and uh, funding from a number of agencies and, and companies. Um, so, uh, as Mauro mentioned, we are in North Carolina, which is right there, and it is a beautiful campus. Uh, we are the oldest public university in the United States, uh, which has, you know, maybe what? We're one third of the age of Oxford, so, you know, just for reference. So, uh, <coughs> Okay, so a little bit of motivation and introduction for, for our work. Uh, a lot of my interests are in energy storage, and uh, you know, looking at the global issues, we can measure uh, the global power use using this very simple equation. Global power use is population uh, times wealth per person times a constant, which actually doesn't uh, differ much from place to place around the world. And so you multiply, basically, you can think of global power use as being driven by population growth and wealth. Uh, and so to kind of look at how this has changed over time, starting in 1980, our x-axis looks at wealth per person. Our y-axis is looking at power use per person. Uh, and then is plotted country by country, where the dot size is population. So moving forward, you can see how these trends play out over time. And what's really quite interesting, you can see how you know, Russia pops on the stage in the 1990s after the fall of the USSR. You see little blips around 2008, I think, with a pandemic, or not, uh, with, with a, a global uh, economic crisis. Um, and so you, know, you see all these very interesting events. But the net thing is looking at what we, where we are now versus where we were 40 some years ago, uh, the world is a, a remarkably different place. Um, so that is just to, to say that uh, our total power use is accelerating tremendously and that uh, we need to find ways of storing that energy in a more renewable way, transitioning to sustainable energy. And so with that as the overall objective of our work, I want to... Uh, transition to layered solids, which have a, uh, a very important 
role in batteries, of course. Uh, most of the uh, primary materials used in batteries uh, have a layered structure, and that's been the focus of the work in our lab. Um, so I, I want to um, classify for you the kinds of uh, host materials and intercalants that people have looked at just to kind of give you a structure for this talk. Uh, we can classify them based on the electronic structure of the host material, as well as the kinds of things that would go into them. So either ions or uncharged molecules. So historically, you know, clays and kaolin were, um, you know, clays, of course, synthesized by nature. Uh, kaolin, uh, 600 AD. Um, we have, in 1841, sulfate, uh, sulfuric acid going into graphite, which was the basis of um, some very uh, early batteries. Uh, 1970s, uh, the advent of the materials for lithium ion batteries. We, in the 70s also, some really interesting work uh, in which Lewis bases were intercalated into transition metal dyed chalcogenides. And it was, at the time, thought that these were actually going in as uh, neutral molecules, but it was only later work that showed that um, the molecules, the bases were decomposing and going in as a mixture of both neutral molecules and charged molecules. Um, uh, in the 1980s, uh, people figured out how to self-assemble transition metal dichalcogenides with a lot of different small molecules. Um, in the 90s, people figured out how to intercalate uh, polymers like nylon into clay, so this was a really important area making polymer nanocomposites. So it was uh, initially reported by Toyota. Um, and 2010 is MX scenes that kind of span a variety of electronic properties, mm -hmm. uh, both neutral and charged molecules. And so from all this work up through 2010, you can see that uh, there's one or two areas on this plot that really have not been investigated heavily, which are these semiconducting materials that either have ions or uncharged molecules. Uh, that changed in 2018 with uh, some prominent papers in Nature where people figured out how to bring in very large cations into transition metal dichalcogenides uh, while retaining the semiconducting properties. And then in 2019, people actually figured out how to mechanically stack molybdenum sulfide with 2D polymers. So these were kind of the first examples in these categories over here um, where these semiconducting materials were being intercalated. So uh, still though, although these are some initial examples, there's just this one example of a 2D polymer. And uh, it would be really interesting if we could put any uncharged molecule into a 2D semiconductor. Uh, and that will be one of the main focuses of the talk. So that'll be our first section of the talk. The second part will be where we actually think about intercalating electrons. So actually in the interlayer space, we're going to be putting in electrons into the, which is a totally fundamentally dif different category than what we typically think about. Uh, and then, so that takes me through these first two sections, the molecule semiconductor super lattices. Uh, second part will be on putting electrons into the interlayer space. And then the third section that is sort of not even, not closely related to it, but it's still kind of interesting and I want to share some initial results on analyzing the structure of thin amorphous films that have this sort of 2D-like structure. So that, that's kind of the outline for the talk. To dive into the first part here, so there's obviously some very prominent work on the assembly, the synthesis and assembly of uh, various building blocks. We know recently uh, the Nobel Prize winners on quantum dots, uh, some beautiful work on self-assembly and their construction into a variety of devices. Same thing for 1D materials, again, three prominent Nobel Prize winners, assembly of these materials into, uh, into complex structures and the formation of uh, very complex devices based on them. So that's what's occurred for 0D and 1D materials. The question is whether we can do something similar for 2D materials. So as I was getting my lab started uh, at UNC Chapel Hill 10 years ago, uh, black phosphorus, it, this layered material, started to become prominent. Um, and Mara also did a lot of this work uh, in Yu Chui's lab. Uh, and 
I was always uh, frustrated that you guys were publishing so so quickly. <laughs> we were we were trying to get started, and you know, Mario comes along and he publishes papers left and right, and you know, beautiful papers. Uh, but um, it was it was a very competitive field. Uh, so our interest in the material um, was uh, you know a lot based off its optical property. So it's, as a bulk material, it has a measured band gap of 0.3 eV. And back in 1981, people predicted that if you made it as a monolayer, its band gap would increase up to 1.8 eV. So it has the same kind of color tunability that is characteristic of quantum dots, so that as you can find the thickness, you can find the electrons, and that changes the optical properties. So that was a pretty cool prediction, but nobody had ever experimentally verified it. So we went to try this by uh, doing a process called liquid exfoliation where we take the material and we simply uh, sonicate it. Uh, it produces this red dispersion. And so that red dispersion clearly indicates that something has happened because it is no longer black. We can then take that and centrifuge that to get the thin flakes separated from the thick flakes. So that produces either the thin flakes that are yellow or the thicker flakes that are brown. And then this is just a, a cubet with just the solvent as a control. So, we uh, did a whole series of thicknesses, and we were able to map out how the band gap of the material changes with the as a function of thickness. And indeed, uh, we found that by the time that you get to a bilayer, the band gap is 1.8 eV. By the time that you get to a monolayer, it's probably closer to 2.2 eV. And a lot of other studies have reproduced that, that those findings. So, <clears throat> um, but that was kind of our start. Okay, we have this really interesting. Uh, quantum confined building block, we did a really simple experiment. So Tyler did a really simple experiment where he took these solutions and just doctor bladed films of them. So creating these thick films that are optically transparent and we can see the color. And you can obviously tell that the yellow film came from the yellow solution. And when my student showed me that result, I said, no, nah, that can't be right. Uh, because we're restacking the material. And so as you stack these materials back together, you, they should lose their quantum confinement. But at least according to this picture, that, that's not what's happening. So there was something going on that we didn't understand. And we wanted to understand that a little bit better. So uh, broadly, the schematic, our initial picture of what we thought was happening is we have these building blocks. We stack them up. And we can produce these color tunable films. That's kind of interesting. We weren't expecting that. Um, but we didn't understand why. And so just to kind of give you a baseline for why we expected stacking these materials should lose the quantum confinement, this was a kind of a classic study where they had a, a monolayer of MOS2, another uh, quantum confined 2D material, direct band gap of 1.86 eV. You can uh, stack a second layer the band gap decreases, so you're losing that quantum confinement. Even if you rotate that and stack it, it still loses uh, some of that band gap, so the band gap is smaller. So you know, different ways of stacking it, you lose that quantum confinement. That's, that's what people knew and kind of expected. So why weren't we seeing that in our systems? So to really start to uh, answer this question better, we switched from black phosphorus to MOS2 because there's a ton of literature data on MOS2 where we could really understand what was going on. So we got a Langmuir Blodgett trough where we could assemble, you can see these yellow films, so the, the 2D MOS2 is also yellow. So we, we would ass assemble these films and then transfer them onto glass slides like you see here, so varying thickness. And the basic approach that we took was we took our bulk MOS2, we exfoliate it chemically with n lithium. That gives us a metallic MOS2. We then reflux that in solution using a small molecule, DMPU, and that converts it back over to the semiconducting form. And it's this semiconducting form that we're self-assembling here in this trough. So uh, these really are high purity monolayer solutions, and uh, that's an important point for uh, going forward here. But so we see this yellow color persist. It looks like this material is quantum confined still, even though that's clearly a multi-layer stack. So why is that? 
we really wanted to get a little bit more quantitative with this. So doing UV-Vis spectroscopy, we could see that if we make a bulk film from thick flakes, that the exciton energy uh, that's characteristic of this, um, you know, it's an important optical transition in the material, uh, is rather different, or at least somewhat different, from that in the 2D films and the 2D dispersions. So even though in the 2D film we are restacking the material, the peak of the exciton is different than in the bulk material. So it's, again, a measure of the quantum confinement. It's not a large shift in the wavelength between those two, but it is indicative of quantum confinement. So we said, okay, it looks like these films are quantum confined. Okay, so if they're quantum confined, they probably, these films are probably not electrically conductive or terribly conductive. Uh, so they have to be, the flakes have to be somehow separated from each other, so they shouldn't be too conductive. To test that, to see if it's conductive, we built up this uh, fairly complicated Van der, Wa, Van der Pa instrument uh, and tested as made films here. And so we found conductivities of about 10 to the minus 6 Siemens per centimeter, and which are already on the more conductive side for solution processed MOS2. So that was, that was not expected. We didn't under, you know, we thought these should not be conductive, but they were. And they also kind of appeared to be quantum confined. So we wanted to go back and say, okay, is this really quantum confined? Um, we need to test this a little bit uh, more carefully. So we went to do these experiments in Diamond Anvil Cell, looking at both photoluminescence and Raman. And what we see here is, uh, so the starting material is at zero gigapascal, uh, has a, a photoluminescence that's characteristic of monolayer MO MOS2, and then as we go to higher pressure, the photoluminescence decreases in intensity and it blue shifts, which is really quite notable because if you think you have these layers and you're pushing them together, if they're coupling to each other, you should get a red shift in the band gap. The band gap should get smaller, but we're seeing the opposite. It turns out that this blue shift in the band gap with compression is a feature that is characteristic of monolayers that's, that's known in the literature. And so we said that this blue shift is, is truly a signature that these are still acting like monolayers even in this, in this 3D solid. We saw similar evidence of this from the Raman spectroscopy where the Raman blue shifts with pressure and that was known to be a characteristic unique to monolayer MOS2. So we have both vibrational information and optical information that says this is really acting as monolayers. And that was difficult to you know, square with the fact that these were really conductive films. So we were confused. A first hint as to what was going on came from when we did secondary ion mass spectroscopy where we've got gallium ions that uh, ablate away the film as well as some of the substrate. And we can see signatures of MOS2 and the silicon as expected, but there was something in here that we did not expect to see, which was cyanide. So we didn't put cyanide into the film. How is that doing there? Uh, we thought back to our synthetic process, and we had to use this molecule DMPU in the refluxing process of converting it from metallic back to semiconductor. So we said, oh, well, maybe there's some DMPU still in the film. It was about the same time that we, you know, this idea of having molecular layers started to appear to us. And so we then looked at these materials by X-ray diffraction. So this is going to be a time series where the experiment starts at the bottom and it goes towards the top over time. We're going to be heating the sample to 300 C, holding there, and then cooling back down. And what we see in the data is first uh, diffraction at an angle of about nine degrees, consistent with the 10 angstrom D spacing. Then upon heating above 240 C, which was the boiling point of that molecule, the D spacing changes and becomes closer to 6.3 angstroms, which is very similar to just bulk, ordinary stacked MOS2 that has nothing in it. So uh, this was a really interesting finding because it showed us that our as-made material is you know, structured, it's periodic, because uh, it's diffracting, 
but it's also about three to four angstroms larger of a despacing than what we were expecting. And so that picture then uh, we <coughs> developed with molecular dynamics, knowing that the DMPU has a thickness of about four angstroms. So these are MD simulations that we've done. We know that experimentally the despacing is 9.92. From our MD, we get a calculated despacing that almost matches that. And so this is showing actually these molecular monolayers uh, moving around, having liquid-like behavior. If we zoom in and look at a single one of these layers from a top-down perspective, you can see that these molecules are laying flat. So uh, we can measure the diffusion coefficient of these molecules, and it actually is very similar to that of bulk uh, uh, bulk solution of the uh, DMPU. So we have these layers, but they're still moving around behaving like a liquid in this system. <coughs> okay, so that kind of explains what we're seeing here. Uh, but, okay, how did this happen? Why, why is this system self-assembling? We did more molecular dynamics to really understand this. So we take these, um, in this simulation, we take two MOS2 layers and we pull them together and you'll see at different stages, uh, you'll see different numbers of layers. So right there we have about two layers. A little bit later we'll have a single clear layer. And so we do these simulations out of a wide variety of interlayer separations from those simulations, we get an idea about the structure of these molecules. And uh, these simulations allow us to actually uh, extract a potential energy curve for the pulling together or the separation of these two MOS2 sheets. So what we see here is that as we pull them together from about 40 angstroms down to the bulk interlayer separation, that the system undergoes a series of oscillations. So this dip right here, low energy, corresponds to three layers. That's two layers, one layer as we saw in the simulation, and then this, of course, is the zero layers. And somehow, we, this, the self-assembly process stops when we get to a single layer that's left. Now, that's, that's interesting, and we suspected that the reason for it stopping when it gets uh, to one layer is because of the height of this barrier. So if you... Um, look back here, you can, you can actually kind of imagine why this happens. So imagine that we want to push this together and squeeze out that molecular layer. So as we compress, the potential energy goes up as we see in the plot. But at some interlayer separation, those molecules are going to get kicked out from the interlayer space. At the moment that they get kicked out, we lose all of the van der Waal interactions between the molecules and the MOS2, and that makes it highly energetically costly to kick those out. So that is essentially the effect that gives rise to this very high barrier that prevents the system from going from this metastable state to what is clearly a much lower state in which the molecules have been totally kicked out. So we trap the system here. <coughs> okay. So that was kind of a, a neat finding, and of course it suggested to us, well, if we can trap the system here, couldn't we also trap the system here? So we tried that for a while with these different molecules, and for the small molecules that we were working with, we could never get the, the uh, like a bilayer to form. We finally suspected that if we would go to slightly a flatter molecule like 15 crown 5, and somehow it's not showing up there on the screen, but 15 crown 5 is kind of a planar uh, molecule, uh, we should actually be able to produce either monolayers or bilayers. So when we put a small amount of 15 crown 5, we get a despacing of 10.6 angstroms, which is characteristic of a monolayer. When we do uh, more 15 crown 5, we actually get a bilayer forming that has a despacing of 15.2 angstroms. So uh, when we do the MD simulations, we indeed see that the 15 crown 5 has a larger barrier separating the bilayer from the monolayer, so we're actually able to trap the system there. And uh, so it actually gives rise to this picture in which you have two discrete layers of molecules 
separating your 2D materials, which I think is a, a relatively new architecture uh, for intercalation or for these layered materials, where you can really start to imagine putting in a wide variety of molecules with different kinds of stacking sequences just through self-assembly. So um, indeed, we've widely generalized this. So we've gone to all kinds of very interesting molecules, self-assembling them. What you can see is that the D spacing generally corresponds to the thinnest dimension. So these molecules lie flat in the inner layer space. And you know we do things like julolidine, which is interesting for LEDs, uh, azobenzene, which has you know this interesting cis-trans behavior, uh, diethylophane, a really important building block for organic solar cells. So there's a ton of really interesting materials that you can start to bend and uh, to, to build uh, and control through the self-assembly. I don't show it here, but we can also go from you know MOS2. We've done it with tungsten disulf uh, diselenide. We've done it with black phosphorus. So there's a wide general generalizability for this uh, synthetic process. So what I think I would argue that we've been building up is really the 2D analog to these quantum dot super lattices. Whereas, you know, in quantum dot super lattices, you have these ligand, uh, ligands that separate the quantum dots. It's a 3D solid that keeps the quantum confined building uh, quantum confined properties of the of the units, we're achieving essentially the same thing for these 2D systems. And I think that will be a really interesting new class of materials for, uh, within these layered solids. OK. So that wraps up the first segment of the talk on these molecular semiconductor super lattices. Um, that work that I just presented is in, in review right now, so hopefully it will be published soon. Uh, the second uh, topic I want to present is this uh, our work on electron anion exchange. <coughs> So this is using these really weird solids, electrides that have electrons in the interlayer space, and use them for actually storing fluoride ions. So the classic or a classic electrode is dicalcium nitride, Ca2n. And you'll first notice that it has a weird stoichiometry. Because if you, if you think in terms of conventional oxidation states, you'd want calcium to be 2 plus nitrogen to be 3 minus, but clearly those, that description is not quite correct since that doesn't add up to zero. So the material is actually synthesized by a high temperature reaction, so it suggests that this is a stable material. A really interesting second feature of this material is the large interlayer separation of just four angstroms. So or four angstroms is large. Uh, graphite is 3.3 .3 angstroms. And it's not obvious immediately why that interlayer separation should be so large, especially if the calcium is an ion with a radius of 1.1 angstroms. Not long after the material was first synthesized, it was suggested rather bravely, because they didn't have a lot of experimental evidence, that uh, they suggested that there are actually excess electrons situated in the interlayer space. Uh, so they proposed this idea. And uh, you can kind of imagine, nobody believed it. Uh, there was probably 20, 25 years of people doing these experimental studies saying, you know, what's really going on is you've got hydride sitting there in the interlayer space that you're not seeing in x-ray diffraction. So then people did neutron diffraction and said, nope, OK, so there's no hydride in there. Well, maybe what's going on is that the metals are in different oxidation states than what you're expecting. And, and that didn't turn out to be quite right either. So. Um, fast forward to 2013, this really interesting paper came out in Nature from the Hosoto group uh, where they grew large single crystals and did very detailed uh, characterization to show that you really do have a material that is um, close to having one electron in the interlayer space for every formula unit. So you really do have something close to calcium 2 plus, nitrogen 3 minus, and one bare electron. So that's, that, uh, that model was um, really experimentally validated, I think, in 2013. So our own work on the material, um, we've done some additional calculations that really help you see the interlayer electrons here. So this is a plot of the electron density close to the Fermi level. And you can see these peaks in charge density that are 
not where the atoms are. So the green points are the calcium, the nitrogen is blue, and between the layers you have electron density, and that is weird. Um, we, we and others have been interested in actually understanding how, how many electrons are in that interlayer space. Uh, we have some work that's now just in review where we've developed a new method for integrating charge in the interlayer space as well as the atoms themselves. And so we draw oxidation states of calcium plus 1.39, uh, nitrogen minus 1.78, and E1 minus. So our calculations really do validate what was suggested earlier from experiments from Hosono, where they said it really is one electron per formula unit. So <clears throat> we knew that a material like calcium nitride existed when we started this project. We also knew that calcium nitride fluoride was a stable material. That material had been synthesized maybe 20 years ago. So towards, moving towards batteries, we said, wouldn't it be interesting if we could go back and forth between these two structures electrochemically, reversibly? And that was, that was the basis of uh, really looking at this idea of swapping fluoride for an electron. So in these electrides, or sorry, I should back up. Um, a lot of our work, our initial work was actually funded by Honda. Honda also did this um, paper that was um, collaborative with Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, so uh, that collaboration, I was not part of this team, uh, that, that collaboration, they reported uh, perhaps the first liquid fluoride electrolyte. Uh, so that allows fluoride to have moderate conductivity uh, through a liquid solution. And with that, uh, kind of opened up the ability to do liquid phase electrochemistry on these systems. So we would get this electrolyte from Honda and started to do some testing of this intercalation process in our lab. We would, uh, the overall picture here is we've got a cathode like copper fluoride getting converted to copper that releases fluoride. Fluoride comes across the electro electrolyte and intercalates into the calcium nitride. The electron is replaced by a fluoride. That electron leaves and goes out through an external circuit completing the circuit. So. This, in some ways, is, has the same kind of flow diagram as a typical battery where you have ions moving through the electrolyte and electrons moving through the external circuit. The key difference is that you actually have the electron being lost not from an atom, but from an interstitial space, one of these electrolyte electrons. So we can write a half reaction that looks like this, and we probably spent a good three years trying to make the system work. Um, so that was like 2015 to 2018 in our lab. <clears throat> and what we could find, what we found is we can convert calcium nitride to calcium nitride fluoride. That works, 100% yield, works perfectly, but we can never go back. <coughs> we tried so many different things and it was never completely clear why the system lacked reversibility. One possibility is calcium nitride fluoride is a wide band gap insulator, and so it's hard to uh, discharge an, an insulator. Another reason that we speculated was because the actual interlayered space changed tremendously when fluoride goes in. So I showed you this 3.9 angstrom interlayer distance in the electrode. We found from X-ray diffraction that it decreases to 3.3 angstroms when fluoride goes in, which if you think about it for a moment, it's really kind of interesting, right? We have a material, we, we add atoms to it, and the material gets smaller, right? And you can understand that because actually a, a fluoride that has all these electrons is smaller than a bare electron, right? The reason is because this bare electron has no nucleus, so that wave function is expansive and spills, fills a large volume. Once you add protons, that shrinks it in. So that's why the fluoride is smaller. And so we speculated that the reason the system might also not be reversible is because of this large structural change 
accompanying the intercalation process. So we, we wanted to search for a material that was not insulating in its fluorinated state, and we wanted to have a system that had not so large a change in the interlayer distance. And that material turned out to be yttrium carbide. So yttrium carbide is another electride. Yttrium is in the third column of the periodic table. So you typically think of this as yttrium 3 plus. And this material, uh, from our own analysis, where we've integrated oxidation states, the yttrium is more like a, a fairly reduced, closer to plus 2. The carbon is minus 2. And there are, um, there's more than one electron. There's about 1.65 electrons in this interlayer space here. So the, these electride sites have uh, more than one electron in them. And so that's the yttrium carbide. We wanted to know, can we convert this over to the fluorinated version? We speculated that we should be able to put two fluorides in per formula unit, just based on the, the count of the electrons. However, this material was not known. We didn't know if this material existed. We didn't know what its structure was. So we went about trying to synthesize it. So we did this high temperature solid state reaction, taking yttrium carbon and yttrium fluoride. We <coughs> formed this material. We solved its crystal structure. Uh, and this is its structure. It, has a, it is a layered structure. So we have these yttrium fluoride layers. And then the fluoride has a staggered uh, layered sequence here. But um, it is layered. The material itself is beautiful. It's like this green gold crystal, uh, reflects light. It's a uh, has a semi, it's a semiconductor with about a 1.7 eV band gap, so it is now semiconducting, not insulating. And one of the really exciting things about this material is we calculated <coughs> the fluoride movement activation energy. It has a barrier of 153 MeV. That's quite low. So lithium and cobalt oxide, lithium and graphite has a barrier between 300 to 400 MeV. This is about half that. If you take into account uh, the Boltzmann equation and kinetics, this factor of two difference leads to a very substantial uh, improvement in kinetics for fluoride transport compared to state-of-the-art lithium ion battery materials. So this, this was quite exciting. OK. So and this, this barrier here is for the fluoride going from this site to a vacancy at that site. Yep. <clears throat> so that was quite exciting. Uh, to explore whether this conversion actually happens, we started by doing this chemical reaction where we can use xenon difluoride as a uh, fluorinating agent. So this is in the gas phase. We take yttrium carbide, and we, at 60 degrees C for six hours, we hoped it would form yttrium carbide fluoride. And indeed, it does. So this is the yttrium carbide before fluorination. This is after fluorination. The colored lines are the refilled fits. So it's a perfect match. So we have something that is close to 100% yield for this conversion reaction. So it really does show we can go from one to the other uh, through fluorination, at least when we have a well-behaved fluorinating agent. So to kind of switch this to a uh, electrochemical environment, because we want to build a battery, we began by predicting what we would expect during this intercalation process. So we built up this phase diagram for the intercalation. This um, basically shows you what phases are stable, going from Y2C to Y2CF2. And I'll point out just that this is a the most computationally intensive calculation that we've ever done. This, this one calculation of this phase diagram is a, is a calculation called a cluster expansion. And it took us 1,200 CPUs, each operating for one year. So it's 1,200 CPU years. Obviously, we do it in parallel, so we don't wait a full year for the calculation to, to finish. But it is an intensive calculation to produce these phase diagrams. From these phase diagrams, we can then uh, produce a predicted voltage uh, as a function of our intercalation. So this sets up our expectation. We've referenced here versus lithium. So the intercalation should start around 0.4 volts versus lithium. So it's very reducing conditions, very, very re reducing. Uh, 
and then it only shifts a small amount during the, the process of intercalation. So uh, recently, we've been working with Oliver Clemens at Stuttgart. Uh, they build solid state batteries. And they provided this, um, the, the capabilities to do this testing as well as this uh, relatively stable electrolyte, lanthanum barium fluoride. So we built up these electrodes, these batteries. Um, actually, I'll point out that I spent two weeks in Ollie's lab this last October, and uh, these, these are the only experiments that I actually did uh, in this whole presentation, so. <laughs> but they actually let me into the glove box and, and did this experiment, so. Uh, so basically the intercalation starts, and again, the, the y-axis here is the same as the y-axis over here. There's, um, the x-axis is different. We're only going out to 0.6 in terms of the fluoride intercalation. What happens if we go farther than that is that the voltage drops dramatically, so, or rises dramatically, if you like. So. At this point, the material really starts to degrade or show evidence of degradation. So, um, but to talk about this a little bit more, we, as we studied the system and looked at X-ray diffraction results, what we really began to see both from the linearity of this, uh, this plot in both of these regions was evidence that the lanthanum barium fluoride was getting reduced itself. We later did a control experiment where we took yttrium carbide and simply combined it with lanthanum barium fluoride. We took those two out, you know, outside of any battery environment and just heated them together. And we found that yttrium carbide fluoride <coughs> formed simply by stealing fluoride from this, reducing that. So even this very stable electrolyte was getting reduced by the Y2C. Uh, the reduction potential of this electrolyte, it's known to be of right at 0.4 volts. So we suspect that we were already starting to reduce it and show some evidence of degradation. So that, that means that this full cycle, it's not reversible. There's still a lot of work to do, but that we are indeed at least showing some fluorination of this that is driven in a Faradaic way. So not all of the fluorination is Faradaic. Some of it is decomposition. Uh, but some of it is actually doing what we hope it will do. <clears throat> so there, that, that is our difficulty right now is, um, let me pop back here. Um, that is our difficulty with the system is these are such good electron donors. We are in search of electrolytes and we hope Voro will, will solve our problems uh, by discovering a electrolyte, a liquid electrolyte that is stable against reduction. That's one possible uh, direction, one possible solution. Another solution is to use electrodes that are slightly less electron donating. And so that's uh, motivated our search looking across the periodic table. So going from yttrium, we first looked at scandium. Scandium is a little bit more electronegative than yttrium. And indeed, we were able to synthesize scandium carbide in this really controlled way. So this is a plot of the um, basically the electron density uh, in these electrolyte sites. So it looks very similar to yttrium carbide. Um, what was interesting about this material is that it was actually a semiconductor, um, is where electrodes are typically metallic. This is the first one that is actually found to be a semiconductor, um, which is kind of surprising given that it has this 2D electron gas. Um, so that was, so we did this experimentally, we realized that material, and we're interested in looking at that in an electrochemical device. We also wanted to march further across the periodic table. Oh, I should point out that the aluminum one is interesting, but it is only a theoretical material. It's not known experimentally. I don't think it's stable, but I just showed there for interest, I guess. <clears throat> so the, recently, we have also experimentally realized titanium carbide. So moving to even a little bit more electronegative, that might be more promising. Uh, so Matt has synthesized ma this material, and it's really quite interesting. So you can see this uh, diamond-like network of this electron gas. It's, it has these octahedral sites that are connected via tetrahedral, so that has <coughs> these tetrahedral nodes just like silicon or diamond. The atoms themselves also form a diamond structure. So you have two interpenetrating diamond structures, one of the electron gas, 
one of the atoms themselves. So this is a what you would call, at least in the block copolymer morphology literature, you would call this a double diamond structure, two interpenetrating diamonds. Um, and they are fully continuous, so it gives us a pathway for intercalating fluoride into this system. Uh, this, I believe, is the first 3D electrode. That is, the topology is this 3D connected network. So um, we are wrapping up that, and we'll have that paper submitted shortly. But um, this is quite, I think, an exciting path forward for us. Um, <clears throat> So what I've told you about is this electrochemical electron anion exchange. That's the broad concept where we're swapping an electron for a fluoride here. And there's some things that are really conceptually different versus ordinary redox processes in a battery. One is because we are swapping the fluoride for an electron. The atoms themselves do not change oxidation states. So in that vantage point, we are, we are investigating electron transfer to and from the material, but there is no redox. And that has a lot of really interesting and fundamental implications. For example, one of them is it does some really interesting things to reorganization energy. If the atoms in the environment are not changing their oxidation states, they're not changing the size, and you're not paying the same cost in terms of reorganization energy. That's exciting. That, that leads to better performance. A second is that we can potentially get high voltage batteries because of the very reducing nature of these electrodes. We just need Maro to help us out a bit. Uh, and so another aspect of them that's quite interesting is we get high, ch we at least get theoretically, because we have not realized this yet experimentally, is high charge capacities. We're putting in two fluorides for every three host atoms. If you compare that to lithium cobalt oxide, one lithium for every three host atoms. Here we're doing two for every three host atoms. Moreover, that's happening with only a 5% volume change. So that's because these electrons take up space so that the volume hardly changes. And that's important for the long-term longevity of a battery is that you're putting in a lot of fluoride and the volume doesn't change, so you, don't, you avoid the mechanical expansion and contraction that happens with every cycle and lets you uh, yeah, potentially demonstrate long lifetimes with these systems. Of course, that's what we're hoping to get to since we're still working out the stability issues in this system. Beyond those materials that I've shown you, we've done high throughput screening that uh, we're really searching for good fluoride ion conductors. Uh, we surveyed through almost every fluoride ion conductor. We surveyed through every fluoride containing crystal that's known and uh, calculated the activation energy for moving fluoride in these different materials, classified the best performing materials in terms of um, finding materials that are stable, that uh, are layered, have activation energies below 1 eV, and that are unexplored previously. And so these are six families of structure types. The actual activation energies are shown here by the bar charts. So we have some that have very low activation energies, like 200 MeV. And I'll just point out that some of these materials are also going to exhibit electron anion exchange as the mechanism by which the interpolation happens. Okay, so that previous study uh, was a massive computational study. Uh, my student, Jack, developed this software, Simate, that allowed us to carry out this study in a high throughput way. The, you know, he was shuffling thousands of files back and forth between different clusters on campus, and he, you know, kind of doing it manually, and he said, there has to be a better way. He looked around for solutions, and he uh, saw open source software that was uh, what's used actually to um, for Instagram. So Instagram, you know, you, you put in a query, it goes to their database, pulls some, you know, data, uh, processes it into a web page, and delivers it back to the user. And it does this in this very high throughput way, because obviously their traffic on the, on the website is enormous. So we said, okay, we have a similar problem in some sense. 
where we have data in our databases that we want to access. That uh, is that database, okay? The processing is what represents a calculation, a new DFT calculation or some other kind of calculation that we want to perform. But then we need to package those results for the end user. And so that effort led Jack to develop this. It is um, it, one of the most impressive pieces of software that I've seen. Uh, he's even written up hundreds of pages of documentation for this um, that you can access via GitHub. And he has automated processes for doing all kinds of DFT calculations. So whether you're just trying to relax his structure, calculate ion transport activation energies, uh, he has features to do evolutionary algorithms that search phase diagrams, which is how we pinpoint interesting materials in the first place. We have code for doing cluster expansion in there. Uh, so it's, uh, all this is uh, highly automated. And the key philosophy um, is kind of unlike the materials project, which is kind of this effort out of MIT and Berkeley, uh, very large effort. Uh, our coding philosophy is really quite different. It's focused around usability and readability of the code. So our code is very easy to read and use, um, and I think can be used for a lot of different purposes. Uh, Jack has gone to uh, work now at Corteva AgriScience, uh, which is a large company in the US, and he's continuing to use and develop that software to do machine learning for a lot of problems at Corteva. So it really is a flexible software interface. Um, okay. The last topic I want to get to, and I, it's just three slides on this last topic, is on thin 2D amorphous films. So uh, I'll cut to the chase really quickly. We, um, over the last few years, developed a very simple approach uh, to, um, sorry, I'm not sure why the images aren't quite fully rendering, but um, to develop a synthetic process to make 2D amorphous materials. We start with sodium chloride. We do a plasma treatment on the surface that the plasma treatment um, generates bare electrons, F centers on the surface. Those F centers, which are these little dots right here, uh, we then expose to water, it produces hydroxyl on the surface. About 25% of the surface sites are hydroxylated. And then that lets us do ALD and we can grow thin films on sodium chloride. Those thin films would not grow if we hadn't plasma treated in the first place. Okay, so we can make these thin films. They're about two to five nanometers thick. Um, and we lift them off by, we spin coat PMMA, we dissolve away the sodium chloride, and then we wash away the PMMA, giving rise to these freestanding 2D amorphous layers. Okay, so we, we did that solely for the purpose, at least initially, of just saying, hey, we made a 2D amorphous material. That's kind of cool. Maybe it's interesting for something. But as we really started to think more carefully about this, we, we realized we had an opportunity. Um, because these samples can be brought into a TEM so easily, we said, hey, maybe this gives us a chance to solve the structure of these amorphous materials. And so what we do, we take the sample, we do diffraction. So this at least when I was a grad student doing TM, if I got a diffraction pattern like this, I would say, that's not interesting, that's garbage. There's, there's nothing there, right? It's just this diffuse background. But actually, there's a ton of information there. And all you have to do to see it is do a Fourier transform, right? So when you do a Fourier transform, you produce this blue curve that has these oscillations. Uh, and that uh, tells us about the prevalence of bond links of certain sizes in, in, in the sample. So we have, for in the alumina, you know, prevalent bonds at uh, 1.8 angstroms, and so on and so forth across here. So we wanted to take this a little bit farther and do a process called reverse Monte Carlo. Uh, that allows you to produce structural models that you can fit to the data. So producing things that are this calculated orange curve here, that gives you confidence that you're producing a structural model that is consistent with that experimental data. Uh, as we started to do that, we were really unsatisfied with the reverse Monte Carlo software that was out there in the literature. So we used Simate to write a uh, new software that does this. So we have now, as part of Simate, this RMC software that allows us to um, basically do this fitting process one of the key features, well, there's a number of key features. 
that's unique to our software. One is that um, it allows us to introduce a vacuum and have defined boundaries, so we can actually solve the full structure of these two nanometer thick films, so we can see both the coordination structures at the surface as well as in, in the interior. It also lets us take into account the different scattering cross-sections that electrons have when they interact with the sample, based not only on the element, which you would hope to do, but also based on its oxidation state, which is, has been ignored so far. So previously, people have ignored uh, how changing oxidation state changes this cross-section, and that has enormous effect if you're considering aluminum 3 plus, 13 electrons versus, or sorry, aluminum 13 electrons versus aluminum 3 plus 10 electrons. You change that by three electrons, you might change your scattering cross-section by about 30%. And then it's the square of that that is the actual scattering intensity. So when you take into account the, the, the proper scattering cross-sections, you have scattering intensities that are off by a factor of two. So most of the software that's out there in literature, when you're looking at things like Illumina, actually has a factor of two error in them. That's not taken into account when you ignore oxidation states. So, okay, so we produce these structures. Now we want to say something meaningful about them. What we next done is do a process, uh, do um, an algorithm that analyzes the local structure of the atoms and uh, produces a vector that repre represents those structures. So we can say for one sample, these blue bars, or in the second sample, these green bars, we have different distributions of coordination numbers. Each one of these coordination numbers we can pick apart into a more detailed analysis of how many tetrahedral or sea sauce type structures that are present. So altogether, we have 49 structural descriptors. And so for an amorphous material, we will have a 49 component vector that describes the distribution of local geometries in that structure. And that ends up being really useful because now we can have a way of talking about the structure of amorphous materials using common sense labels and start to relate structure and properties or a synthesis to structure in these materials. So, right, so basically, you know, we're hoping to develop a synthesis structure and structure property relationships using these um, tools from TEM uh, in these nanoscale amorphous materials. We can imagine new, new understanding might emerge in SEIs, amorphous catalysts, or bulk metallic glasses, um, and some key features, right? We have the ability to use a very highly focused probe, uh, focusing that electron beam down just to the atoms in the surface to get a measure of that local structure. And then that structure is useful as a vector for processes like machine learning. So we can start to develop these relationships. So, so I'll wrap up. Um, this is just a movie in the background that um, is one of our other studies, watching graphite being intercalated with sulfuric acid, which is beautiful. Um, so, first we've discovered the 2D and analog of quantum dot super lattices with these molecule semiconductor super lattices. Um, I've, we're working towards demonstrating electron anion chain exchange, so electrochemical intercalation without redox. And we're advancing RMC to solve some new problems in amorphous materials. So again, I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually did this work. Um, and I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yes, John. Yes. So I see that there's, a, there's reason to be excited about this low volume change with the fluoride ion yes. um, electrodes. Um, do you have a sense for how much the strain is changing as you swap an electron for a fluorine? So, yeah, so the, the, the volume expansion is 5%, um, and it's mostly in the C direction. So it's mostly like five, maybe 4% in the C direction, and maybe 1% in the X and Y directions. So that's, that's yeah, those are, those are the linear, linear dimensions. And we don't expect um, stress to build up, at least, Based on the powder x-ray diffraction, the lattice constants are changing. So we know that we do have that change in volume. So there shouldn't be yeah, uh, much residual stress in the material. 
and that the calcium environment is that changing quite significantly? Yeah, so the calcium changes uh, volume a lot. So that's changing from that almost four angstrom down to 3.3 angstrom. Whereas the yttrium carbide, it starts at 3.3 and I think it goes to 3.4 or something like that. So it's a very small interlayer spacing change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes? What liquid would you intercalate in MOS to, to be energy interesting in terms of energy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for a system that has the, these molecular liquid intercalated, this is really more of a capacitor or pseudocapacitor type system, more like the MXenes that have shown some really interesting pseudocapacitive behavior. Um, when you have this solvent layer or molecular, uncharged molecular layer that's there, that limits the extent to which ions can have strong interactions with that host material. So you often don't see the strong change in the oxidation or reduction of the host material when ions come into those systems. So it could be more interesting in a pseudo-capacitive standpoint or a capa capacitive standpoint. Yeah. yeah. Ben? Yeah. Yeah, I saw the question about the uh, lupin disulfide. So it's used itself as a lubricant. I was wondering if you considered any of the tribological properties of these really fine layer. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, you know, the, the sliding properties, um, the sometimes uh, in 2D materials, this property is called super lubricity, um, where if you take two of these, like, MOS2 layers, and they are stacked at some misorientation, you've lost that ability of the material to interdigitate. So the sulfur atoms from one layer kind of lock into the sulfur atoms from the adjacent layer when it's crystalline, but when you pull them apart and you rotate them a little bit, they don't, the interlayer spacing is a little bit larger and these layers can slip past each other. So those effects occur when you lack registry between the adjacent materials in the system. So when you add in a molecular layer, you might expect something similar to happen. Uh, we haven't investigated it, because um, clearly the molecular layers, they move, they flow as a liquid, so it's possible that the lack of registry in this atomic structure to this substrate, to the, to the MOS2, is going to allow good sliding. There could be also frictional effects that result from interactions of just the molecular liquid itself. Um, one of the interesting things that we've been looking at is actually the fluidity uh, or the diffusion of these 2D molecular layers. Looking at this via molecular dynamics, we've actually found some molecules in a, the 2D layer have much faster diffusion than in their 3D counterpart because the, forcing the molecules to lay on their side limits the extent to which they might have strong intermolecular forces and they can move fast past each other. Uh, whereas in 3D, they will have different interactions that are possible. And so if the 2D case eliminates strong interactions, you can actually get much faster diffusion in 2D than in 3D. And so that, that aspect of um, the friction or diffusion is really going to be an interesting aspect, I think, for us to study in the future. So, yeah. Yes. Well, I just uh, was wondering if you studied or thought about the possible electronic or optical effects from the interaction between these layers and the molecules in between the layers. Do they couple? Do they yeah. flow? Or so, yeah, so. Some device physics and some kind of yeah, so. Uh, we haven't really explored that. Uh, we've only produced these structures. The ones where we've done photoluminescence, the molecules have an electronic structure where they have basically a fairly low-lying uh, homo and a high-lying lumo, and so that prevents charge transfer to the molecules. Um, and that's useful just from a standpoint of investigating the MOS2's quantum confinement. But what you point to is another interesting direction, which is, you know, Designing systems where you can con controllably transfer charge, maybe you want to do photochemistry, uh, drive some process in the, the molecular layer. These um, systems that have molecules are often used in filtration. So uh, you can actually envision that you could combine both some aspects of filtration, 
with some photochemistry that you can drive now that you have these semiconductor layers there. So, but again, you have to get, think carefully about which molecules in their alignment of homos and lumos in order to drive that photochem photochemical processes. So, yeah. Has anyone measure the diffusivities of fluoride ion in your electrodes and electrodes like this? Yeah, so um, with Ollie Clemens, they've recently uh, measured um, the fluoride ion conductivity in the Y2CF2 system. Mm -hmm that is both doped and undoped. And the conductivities that we observe uh, are low, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus nine Siemens per centimeter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, however, in those systems, they haven't annealed them, so they just press the powders together mechanically. And so that data is very preliminary. We need to actually, and we were talking about this with some of your students earlier, is how do we understand transported grain boundaries? Uh, and you know what are the procedures that you would have to <coughs> minimize that transport or min minimize that interfacial resistance? Um, so yeah, so that's something that we're still developing understanding of. Yeah. Yeah, Lawrence. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I'm more interested in like the electrochemical characterization of this yttrium electrolyte. Yeah. So you say you suspect it as like a chemical fluorination of the electrolyte, but you know surely that would sort of form like kind of an SEI on on the outside, like. Shouldn't you still be able to then see in your characterization kind of iron lexically water material or something? Yeah, so that was kind of what I alluded to um, in the electrochemical data, um, which is um, for this, basically, as that lanthanum barium fluoride decomposes, it becomes less of a fluoride conductor. And so oh, okay. we, if we continue this experiment out past 0.6, the data does that, and very quickly <coughs> we're getting no voltage. Uh, that yeah, so it, it very quickly. So if, right, so we get that passivating blocking SEI if we go too far, um, and yeah, so it's it's for this first part of it, it's not it's happening, but it hasn't blocked fluoride transport yet. Yeah. One more question. We're only a tiny bit late. Anyone?